My name is Richard Fahey. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Skoll Foundation, and I'll spend a little time talking about the foundation in a minute. Um, from the materials that Catherine provided about the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, and especially from the conversations that I've participated in just in the last 24 hours with Rosemary, with Catherine, with Rob, and, and others, I know that you aren't just informed about social investment, but that you are actually practitioners, and I really look forward to learning from you and um, sharing our experiences in, uh, in, the, in, the, in this afternoon. Um, I've been with the Skoll Foundation for nine years. I was with Hewlett Packard before that, so my background is mostly in corporate finance and operations, and I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to join the foundation in 2004 when it was going through a growth spurt. It was about four years old at that point and I came on board to build out the, uh, the finance, the operations, the human resources, um, the, the grant management, the legal, and the interface with our investment managers, Capricorn. I recently read an article in the Wall Street Journal that started with an economics joke I don't know if there are any economists out there, or, um, but it's, it's very short. It says that uh, there's an old joke about economics examinations. The questions never change, but the answers always do. <laughs> and having studied economics and following the, and tracking the uh, developments in the dismal science over the years, that really resonated with me. I can imagine the questions, you know, What's the proper size of the, of the federal government's debt? That answer changing as, as time passes, theories change, experiences change. So I was thinking about that today because I think there is a, a question that could be on a hypothetical economics exam that's relevant to what we're talking about that, this afternoon. And that question is, how does capital serve society? And I think that's, it's a question that its answers would change uh, as, as time passes. And uh, when I joined the Skoll Foundation in 2004, I remember two references that influenced my perspective on that question as I was joining the organization. One was a debate that was in the press then, and it still continues to some extent, about the payout rates of U.S. foundations. And one side of the, the debate cited the approximately half a trillion dollars that foundations had amassed in capital at that point. And typically, those foundations were spending about 5% of that capital to serve society through their charitable payout. And the articles and the, the debate uh, on one side went on to say that the needs of society are much greater than that 5%. And it, it would be better for society if that payment, if that payout was actually accelerated from the perspective, to some extent, from an economics perspective, that uh, a dollar spent today could have more impact than a dollar spent at some point in the future just because of discounting. But that, that if you can solve a problem today, if you can increase the education, the health outcomes of someone, that doesn't help just them, but it helps future generations. The other side of the debate would take the position along the lines that there'll be new problems in the future, there'll be new solutions. And it would be prudent and wise to reserve capital to address those problems. That debate didn't really change, as far as I could tell, any, uh, any public policy. I think it still exists to some extent. When we, um, I was gonna say, as we went through the fiscal crisis in the United States, I know it continues. But e even then, recently, it was just on the margins of the discussions of whether those policies should be changed in terms of the tax benefit that's given to foundations. And um, part of that debate also could be, well, if, it, if you didn't have the money going into foundations, it would be collected by, in tax revenue by the government, and the government would certainly spend the money today rather than giving it to investment professionals to, uh, to um, build up for future use. The other influence was a meeting that we had at the, uh, at the foundation when I just joined with Jed Emerson who was the uh, author of the concept of blended value, which is also uh, underpinning things like in impact investing and double and triple bottom line investing, which really is about not 
recognizing that it's not prudent to make a financial decision, with, decision without regard to considering the social impact. And he pointed out not so much the pay down uh, element of how foundations manage their, their capital, 95% managed in perpetuity and the 5% payout, but rather that the 95% could actually be invested in ways that aligned with the foundation's mission. Or often, foundations would be caught managing the endowment in ways that, was, that were misaligned or even were counter to their mission. And that's an example like a foundation that's trying to improve health outcomes and investing in cigarette companies at the same time. So both of those debates influenced me as I was joining the foundation world, and I hoped that I would have the opportunity to engage the foundation in some way with those debates as I came on board. So let me talk about Jeff's goal a little bit, and then I'll get back to how the foundation is addressing those questions. Jeff um, was the second employee at eBay, and in terms of his personal narrative, he describes as a youth, as a teenager, he read a lot of books, and he was impressed by the power of stories to inform him, to inform him of trends in the world, which if we're not addressed, the world would be a worse place for future generations. So those, these stories opened his eyes and inspired him, and he aspired to someday to be a writer of such stories. But in his personal narrative, he'll say how rather than become an author, he became an engineer, went to business school, and started a few companies, including joining eBay at its formative stage. After the eBay IPO, Jeff found himself with the resources to pursue his deep desire to make the world a better place. He left eBay and uh, shortly thereafter formed the, the foundation. And Peter was really a mentor for him in his, in his early philanthropy. Our, uh, the, the Skoll Foundation CEO describes Jeff as having the mind of an engineer and the heart of an artist. And for the last decade, he's been putting his capital and creativity behind a vision of a sustainable world of peace and prosperity. Jeff has created a set of enterprises that pursue this vision in different but related ways. I think uh, briefly before I describe these, it's important to know that Jeff did not start with this succinctly stated vision, and nor did he have a blueprint that led to the formation of these entities. He is much more entrepreneurial than that, meaning that there has been a lot of experimentation, there's been a reconfiguration of resources, and that this will continue. But each of these are, dis are developing skills and networks and assets that are guided by his vision. Participant Media is a media company based in, in Southern California in Hollywood that's really the primary manifestation of Jeff's aspiration to be able to tell stories that move people. So rather than being an author, he figured out pretty quickly that um, film and other forms of media are really the way to get to people now. We're going to show a little video clip uh, later at the end of this session about some of the films the partici participant has made. An Inconvenient Truth is one of the great examples where they've produced a film that really had an impact on how people think about global warming. Um, and I, I'll mention right now that uh, Participant is getting into the television business with a, a new channel called Pivot that will go out on, on the airwaves in the United States uh, this summer. And that's geared toward millennials. And so it's, it's inter interesting to see Jeff create these different assets, media assets. This is a far profit that it's pursuing his vision of entertainment that inspires. SGTF is a separate but related private foundation to the Skoll Foundation. Jeff, um, probably about four years ago, I'm going to talk about the Skoll Foundation in a moment, but SGTF is focused on a handful of, um, of threats that Jeff feels that need to be addressed with some urgency. And this is an example where he is willing as a philanthropist to go into a pay down mode, if you will. It's about $150 million that he said he is willing for this organization, which is just three or four years old, to put toward trying to make uh, a dent in to mitigate pretty significant problems, global warming, pandemics, water, scarcity, 
the Middle East, specifically Israel and Palestine, and nuclear proliferation. The guy who heads this said, you know, Jeff, after we, we solve one or two of these, you know, give us a few more. Um, so, but I'm not here to talk about those threats today. And then uh, Capricorn Management is the investment manager across the board, manages Jeff's wealth, but also manages the foundation's corpus and also manages some other people's funds. And the, the foundation has a few programs. The Skull World Forum uh, is a, a convening that we have in Oxford every year. And the Skull Center for Social Entrepreneurship is a, a center that we have at the Oxford's uh, Said Business School. So we made the investment in, the, in social entrepreneurship, uh, education around social, social entrepreneurship at Oxford, and then from that has grown this, uh, this convening that occurs every year. And now we're trying to, to make that perpetual through the scoldworldforum.org uh, website. So let me talk about the foundation a little bit. Our mission is to drive large-scale change by investing in, connecting, and celebrating social entrepreneurs and the innovators who help them solve the world's most pressing problems. We don't focus particularly on any one issue. Uh, Jeff and Sally Osberg, who's our CEO, at the beginning did look at issue focus. I'm, I've been told that microfinance was one that they looked into. Um, but Jeff said, well, and this was back in 2002, 2003, he concluded, well, microfinance seems to have already hit critical mass. I don't think there's really anything catalytic that, that we can do there. And he didn't want to follow or just participate. And he and Sally talked with John Gardner, who is a, a social entrepreneur, if you will, civic leader, uh, from the United States, who was in the Johnson administration. Some of you might know him. And Jeff asked him for advice of what he should do with his philanthropy. And John Gardner said, bet on good people doing good things. And that led to the focus on social entrepreneurs. And at that point, and this is 2003, 2004, the term wasn't really well known. And the, 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 um, the mission then became to build the field of social entrepreneurship. And we feel that we've uh, been fairly successful in helping that occur. A shorthand definition of social entrepreneurs that we use is that they are society's change agents. A longer definition that Sally and Jeff just provided to the Financial Times because they asked Jeff was that social entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship carried out for social benefit. Social entrepreneurs are every bit as innovative, disciplined, and driven as business entrepreneurs but their ventures focus on solving entrenched social problems. Poverty, environmental degradation, lack of access to health care, inadequate education, and more. Just as entrepreneurship helps advance economic progress, so social entrepreneurship moves humanity in the direction of a more peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. Our definition doesn't focus on social enterprises, per se. It's focused on applying, and it's not focused on applying business skills to social problems or running charities. Those are important concepts, and, and sometimes you'll see the definition of social entrepreneurship in that con context. But it's more about, like any entrepreneur, those innovations that disrupt the status quo in such a way that everyone is better off. So we seek to support these people and organizations by investing in them. We do that through grants and through program-related investments, and I'll give a few examples of those, but also by connecting them with each other and by other resources that enable them to scale their innovations. And thirdly, by celebrating their successes. And you can see that with what we do with the Skull World Forum. And the, the element of celebration is another manifestation of Jeff's just very deeply held belief in the power of storytelling. So media and storytelling are, is a, an area that the foundation is heavily invested in, alongside its grant making and its convening. So getting back to the, the question and the debate that I mentioned before, not too long after I joined the foundation, I had the opportunity with our CEO to engage the board in the question about mission alignment. And we, we didn't do this in terms of going to the, the board with a, an ask or a recommendation to do program-related investments or screening our, our, um, our portfolio for 
say, health or um, carbon investments, are investing in, in companies and taking shareholder resolution positions, uh, our mission and late related investing or impact investing. Rather, we really tried to, to frame the conversation at what we thought was the highest level, which was simply that capital is really a fundamental, even defining resource for a private foundation. And how a foundation would use its capital is a, is a very important strategic decision. And so we gave the board, in terms of a frame, a choice between what we called the the typical foundation model, which we've referred to before, the 95% of capital that's, a, that's invested, to throw off a 5% annuity for the charitable work. And we labeled this the binary approach. And we contrasted it with a, a, a more innovative approach. And the Heron Foundation slide that, that Peter shared with you is, is, um, is you're coming from the same source that there are a spectrum of opportunities for foundations to apply its, uh, its capital to pursue its mission. So certainly the grants, but also programs, direct programs like we do with the Skull World Forum, and then program-related investments. And then going into the investments, there are opportunities to become a more engaged shareholder by the way we vote uh, proxies on shares that we hold. And also in terms of security selection, which can look like negative screens, are positive screens. These are some of the screens that we've used in the past, environmental risk. Um, a participant made a, a film called Darfur Now that tried to bring attention to the genocide in Darfur. And that was an opportunity for us to join with some organizations that were putting shareholder resolutions forward for companies that were, su were supporting uh, the Darfur government and to have them take a, a, a stand against the genocide there. And then we use screens that are influenced by participants' uh, films. For the films that participant makes, they typically have a social action campaign that runs alongside them. And we, try to, we strive to stay in sync with that, with those social action campaigns. And then there are an ever-growing uh, body of aligned investments that Capricorn's making from our corpus. And as we've evolved our capital model, Capricorn in parallel has been evolving its principled investing approach. And Depender will give you more examples of those in a moment. I'm going to give a couple examples in the program-related space uh, next. And I want to start with... Um, let me, go, let me go through this first. As we did this with the board, I should say, they, they chose the second approach, the innovative approach. It was pretty simple the way that we had framed it. The, the binary approach, you guys are a new board, you want to be innovative. And as, as we have pursued this, it's definitely the one benefit is that there's more of the foundation's capital and resources that we can put toward working with its, uh, on its mission. But as one board member pointed out when we had that conversation, making investment decisions is already a pretty complex discipline. If you add more variables, it's, there are limits into how good a decision you can make when you get up to five, six, seven, eight variables. So that, that's definitely something that we need to continue to strive to do to keep the decision simple and focused. There's also the benefit of focusing on and, and assessing impact across the whole portfolio. We don't have any secret answer to that, but it's something that we always need to be asking ourselves as we go into an investment from a social aspect, from a mission aspect, what are we hoping to get out of this? And then there's the network effect and the momentum. By network effect, I mean an opportunity like this to engage with others who have similar interests and are on a similar path. And another challenge and an opportunity to this is opening up to aligning more of the capital with the mission means that you need certain talents and skills on staff. We've been very fortunate to have people who had some experience in terms of navigating the regulatory aspect, but also looking at this from mission first, but having knowledge of the different financial tools that could be brought to bear beyond a grant. So let me talk about a few of those. Root Capital is an organization that um, 
builds rural prosperity in poor, environmentally vulnerable places in Latin America and Africa. And uh, it connects smallholder co-ops in these places with the global um, food, food uh, supply chain, providing uh, product to companies such as The Body Shop, General Mills, Green Mountain Coffee, Starbucks, and Whole Foods. And, and Root Capital does this by lending capital and providing capacity building and training to these co-ops that enables them to access these global markets. With, a, with access to credit and financial management training, Root Capital clients are able to increase their product's volume, quality, and consistency, and therefore become more reliable suppliers. And without access to such capital and viable markets for their crops, millions of small-scale farmers in the world are trapped in poverty. Pro, pro, uh, poverty sorry. So, in terms of what Skoll's done with Root Capital, since 2005, we've, through a mix of unrestricted grants, loans, the storytelling, research, and strategic networking, have helped them to exceed half a billion dollars in cumulative lending to smallholders. Financially, we've made about $11 million of investments in the form of grants and loans to Root since 2005. But it's not just the financial investments. We funded through in a partnership that we have with Sundance um, a video about what Root Capital does. And I was really pleasantly surprised and pleased when I talked with someone from Root a few years ago. Uh, they said that Starbucks had used that video to show its employees how Starbucks was benefiting people in their supply chain. In the video, it's only about seven minutes long, but it, it brings that point it brings that point home. In terms of the financial engagements, we made a $2.5 million 1% loan to Root Capital about five years ago to lower its cost of capital so that it could raise capital at, at higher rates and the blended rate would still be competitive in terms of the, the rate that it wanted to provide to the, the small holders. And then as Root Capital prepared over the last couple of years to raise much more capital, we made a $3 million grant as a first loss loan reserve that has helped Root build a $100 million loan fund during 2012. So they're on a really good trajectory in terms of scaling up their, their lending in this, in this space. But beyond the, the storytelling and the financial investment, the Skoll Foundation recently co-funded with the City Foundation a research report on catalyzing smallholder agricultural finance. We did this as a, a kind of a co-investment in, um, in the recent uh, capital raise that, that Rue was involved in, that we, that was what the three, the three million dollar uh, first loan loss reserve was for. But we wanted to help educate more uh, people in this space and this, the um, Dahlberg is the organization that prepared this report but it, it helped lay out the ecosystem of this lending uh, activity, and not just about Root, but th other parties that are in the, in the same space. So it's an example of beyond the storytelling and the financial investments, how foundations can invest in research, ecosystem landscaping, that help others understand the, the opportunities in the space. So Root and the foundation have grown together over the last eight years. Another example is Riders for Health. Riders for Health manages and maintains vehicles for health-focused partners in sub-Saharan Africa. The, uh, the Coleman's, Andrea and Barry Coleman, are the founders of this organization, and they are first and foremost motorcycle enthusiasts. They were traveling in Africa when they saw abandoned motorcycles in, in countries that they were traveling in and inquired, well, What's going on with these vehicles? These are people who love motorcycles. And they were told that those motorcycles belonged to the ministries of health. They had been donated by large international aid donors who would donate the vaccines, the medicine uh, capacity around health care. And the ministries of health didn't know how to maintain those vehicles and didn't really care because when they broke down, 
a new fleet would be donated, donated by the international uh, health agencies. So it's an example where Barry and, and Andrea saw an opportunity, and they started Writers to Health to provide vehicle maintenance and management services to the ministries of health. I think they, they talk in terms of providing the last mile link in, ter uh, in terms of healthcare in remote villages in Africa. Writers for Health, in, uh, for the first several years, would not own the vehicles. They would provide the, uh, the maintenance and management services. In our discussions with them over several years, we queried each other, what would it look like if writers actually owned the vehicles? How would that change the model? And so they identified Gambia in, the, in, uh, in Africa as an opportunity to see if writers could develop their business models, shift it so that they would own the vehicles and provide a complete wraparound service to the Ministry of Health. So that, that's a shift in their model. They needed to buy the vehicles. They didn't have the capital to do that. We could have loaned them the money to, to buy the vehicles, but we wanted to push this and see what we could do with them to really establish them as viable commercial borrowers. So we put a, a loan guarantee at a bank in the Gambia, and that, that bank made the, the loan to, to writers. Initially, the bank didn't quite understand what we were doing because they wanted to charge writers 14% uh, interest and pay us 3% on the deposit that we had put up. And uh, we, we had to point out, you know, this is really guaranteed, so you're not taking that kind of risk. So they lowered it to about a 4% spread. And over the last three or four years, the Ministry of Health has agreed to buy the services at a higher rate from, uh, from writers, and writers has been able to start paying down the loan. And we get our money back from the deposit. And it seemed like they were gonna, the, the Gambia was going to stop uh, with about two-thirds coverage in terms of the fleet service. But recently, they've decided to buy the, the last third of the fleet, which was uh, exactly the sort of thing that we were looking for. And now Gambia is the first country in Africa that can say that there's uh, trans health care transportation available to every person in the country. So this is another example where it's, there's the, the financing aspect of it, the storytelling is there also, and there was a capacity building grant of about $300,000 that we made at the same time that we put up the loan guarantee and helped negotiate the loan. And that $300,000 was to build out the capacity the writers needed to be able to manage this new business model. And I want to give a third example with Amazon, which is an organization in Brazil that is a nonprofit, and uh, the gears itself, or positions itself as a research organization, but they um, provide a monitoring of the Amazon rainforest using satellites. And it's the first independent deforestation monitoring system in Brazil. And the state of Pará, which is one of the largest states, in partnership with Amazon and others, is on a path to achieve net zero deforestation by 2020. We don't have a, a complete story here in terms of social investment, but a large international uh, development institution is, has approached Amazon about Amazon throwing off or spinning off a far profit organization to capitalize on the satellite imaging that they have developed. And we're interested in being a co-investor in that startup of that, uh, that for-profit. But the, the point I want to make right now is that uh, development agency is waiting for Amazon to come forward with a business plan to attract, uh, say, five or six million dollars of startup capital. But they won't fund the capacity building that Amazon needs to, to, to develop that business plan. So there's an opportunity for the foundation, and we're considering grant funding uh, that activity with Amazon to really catalyze that, that great opportunity for them to expand. Okay, this is a, kind of a developmental slide as I was working on this um, conversation this afternoon. I wanted to get back to this, how does capital serve society? And I've shared this with a couple of people and conversations 
ensue. But in terms of demands by society, there are public goods and public services. There are market-provided products and services. There are market gaps and market failures that need to be addressed. And then where school likes to focus, there's the innov innovations and disruptions that can improve the outcomes of any one of the other um, demands or needs that society has. Then there are the actors and institutions that serve these needs. The government, private enterprises, public owned enterprises, public subsidized enterprises. You could fit charities in here. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's the capital. Government capital, private capital, ph philanthropy, development aid, and public policy. When I show this to people, I think I showed it to Depender. He said, well, you know, you should put a bar across the top, right? Because you're trying to connect the tax revenue, the government, the government as the provider to public services. Or private capital to private enterprise to market provided um, services and products. But the point is that it's not that simple. And uh, philanthropy in particular can play across this spectrum, can help to catalyze what may be always a public good or a public service. And so in terms of impact investing or social investing, you're never really gonna see market rates of returns if that's what it is that you're trying to solve. Uh, and there are opportunities, and, and I think Depender will talk to some of these, that can be manifested eventually in terms of market-based products and services. And phila philanthropy can fund uh, research and activities, products, to fill market gaps, like Writers for Health and Root Capital are both doing. So I wanted to end with some references. Just real quickly, I think people are familiar with GIN, with the Global Impact Investing Network. There's another organization called Tonic, and I don't think uh, Tonic really stands for anything other than it goes with GIN. And it's a, seriously, it, it's, it's an international impact investors network it's based in Silicon Valley, but they do have members from all over the world, none from Australia, but I talked to the person who leads it and he would be happy to talk to high net worth Australians who wanted to join this network. So it's really like a, a venture capital angel uh, network for impact investing. The Mission Investors Exchange is something that might be worth checking out. This is a, a group of uh, US foundations, private foundations, who have bought into using more uh, than the 5% of, of their capital to advance their mission. And from blueprint to scale, the case for philanthropy and impact investing, which is, was published by the Monitor Group and funded by Acumen, is another piece that emphasizes the role for philanthropy to, use, to really think in terms of a spectrum and not just impact investing, but the, the points made here that uh, Foundations should think about using more of their grant funding to actually catalyze impact investing. Um, Standing with the Poor is an article that Jacqueline Novogratz from Acumen wrote recently in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And building venture capital from within was also an SSIR piece recently where the Knight Foundation talks specifically about how they're shifting their, the venture capital and private equity portion of their investment portfolio to invest in media companies that are consistent with what they do in terms of their mission. Uh, Knight is, is a, you know, the background's in publishing and, and their mission is very much around uh, the media. Impact Investing Gets Real at the School World Forum was, was written just recently. And this is another piece that takes a position, and this was from Chris, uh, Chris West at the Shell Foundation we thought, well, this, this impact investing is pretty easy. Once we start doing it, things are going to change. A lot of other people are going to do it. We're going to see a lot, of, a lot of improvement. But it's not that simple. And the, um, the impact investor best practices in impact investing is uh, by a community uh, development organization in the United States. But it's another source I've, I've seen, uh, a good source, of reflections on best practices in, in the impact, impact investing space. Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce Depender. Depender is going to focus a little bit more on the investment uh, part of the spectrum and representing Capricorn, not just from the foundation's perspective, but across all of Jeff's investments. So thank you. <laughs>